Mass protests against Sudan's junta show no signs of slowing down, despite a brutal crackdown by security forces. Thousands took to the streets of the capital Khartoum on Wednesday. At least 15 protesters were killed by live ammunition. It is said to be the bloodiest day since General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan overthrew an uneasy unity government on October 15th. In less than a month, 39 people have died in crackdowns. Tens of thousands rallied nationwide over the weekend to demand a return to civilian rule. Eight demonstrators were killed, including three teenagers, and hundreds were arrested. According to a pro-democracy doctors' union, security forces stormed a hospital in Omdurman and detained several of the wounded. We want to bring down the military council and bring back the civilian government. We are tired of the military rule, and we hope that not a single soldier will rule us. No political solution is in sight, despite intense international pressure. Sudan had been on a path toward a democracy and stability. Returning to that path is the best way for Sudan to attain peace and prosperity, become a leader on the continent, and uh, to restore very strong support from the international community. But the junta is digging in its heels. General Burhan has reappointed himself as head of the Sovereign Council, the highest transitional authority. Sudan remains disconnected from the rest of the world, with internet services cut off and telephone lines disrupted. South Africa holds four days of mourning for its last apartheid-era president, F.W. de Klerk, who died on November 11th, aged 85, of cancer. The death of the man who won the Nobel Peace Prize with Nelson Mandela in 1993 drew mixed reactions in South Africa. De Klerk released Mandela from prison and spearheaded the dismantling of white minority rule. But he never fully owned up to the horrors of the apartheid past or took responsibility for atrocities. Apartheid is a crime against humanity and something which him and all those who have gone before him and all those who will still come after him for the brutality against black people will be punished for. Some people were very positive about what he did and some people were very negative. I guess in the end history and time will judge his uh, legacy and um, we are very sorry to hear about his passing. De Klerk addressed his controversial legacy in a video released after his death. Let me today, in this last message, repeat. I, without qualification, apologize for the pain and the hurt and the indignity and the damage that apartheid has done to black, brown and Indians in South Africa. But the deathbed apology failed to pacify critics. His family will hold a private funeral on Sunday. Four people were killed and dozens injured in twin suicide bombings in the Ugandan capital Kampala on Tuesday. Armed police and soldiers patrolled the capital following the attacks claimed by the Islamic State group. It is the latest in a string of attacks in the East African country. Two suicide bombers on motorcycles detonated devices near Parliament and another targeted a checkpoint outside the central police station. Former star striker Samuel Eto'o has officially filed his candidacy for the presidency of Cameroon's Football Federation. A crowd of supporters accompanied the four-time African Footballer of the Year, who also played for Barcelona and Inter Milan, as he submitted his bid at the headquarters in Yaoundé. He rejected an offer to become the body's vice president instead of running. There is no debate, there is no proposal for a first vice president. I will be the next president of the federation, despite all the cheating. But even so, we say, let's go to the polls and let these delegates assume their responsibilities to finally give Cameroonian soccer the opportunity to become what it should be. 
The Court of Arbitration for Sport in January annulled a 2018 election. A new vote will take place in December, a month before Cameroon hosts the Africa Cup of Nations. Ali Abdi Almi is always on the lookout for grass for his camels in Somalia's desert. After hours on foot, there's nothing better than a drink of fresh camel milk. I drink camel milk because it's nourishing. The milk is good for us because camels graze from trees with medicinal properties that help fight diseases. I have five children and we all depend on camel milk to survive. Camels mean life for Almi. They are his transport, and their meat and milk are food and income. The animals are immensely important here. In Somalia, camels mean status. This cattle market manager explains. <laughs> Camels are very important in Somali culture because someone is considered rich or can rise in social status according to the number of camels he has. There are seven million camels, almost one for every two Somalis. Beyond status, they are a valuable investment. A healthy camel can sell for up to $1,000. But only a few people can afford them. Seven out of ten people live in poverty, according to the World Bank. To make things worse, rain is becoming scarcer, making it difficult for herders. As a breeder, I have to face many difficulties. I am facing drought and famine, which has consequences. My fellow rangers and I have lost a lot of camels and cattle. The changing climate in the Horn of Africa has forced nomads to travel farther for water and grazing. There was a cyclone at the end of 2020 and several droughts. Repeated natural disasters have decimated thousands of camels and other livestock. Now pastoralists are giving up trying. Millions have moved to the cities, trying to flee hunger and desperation. <laughs>